All right, it looks like we are officially live now. Hi, my name is Joe Brockmeyer, and uh, today we are doing an open cloud chat, um, moderating the chat. Um, this is going to be sort of a preview of what we're going to be doing at the Enterprise End User Summit in a couple of weeks in New York City. Uh, today we're going to have with us Greg de Koningsberg, and we're also going to have Alan Clark. Uh, I believe Chip Childers from the CloudStack Project is going to be joining. Uh, we're also expecting Richard Morrell from Red Hat. Greg, of course, is from Eucalyptus, and Alan is with SUSE uh, and OpenStack. Um, so we're going to go through some questions we've already gotten prepared, and we're also going to ask you if you have any questions you'd like to see the panel answer, to go ahead and submit those in chat, and our offline moderator will be giving us those questions to go through. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with some of the questions we already have prepared. Uh, first question. Um, a lot of people are concerned about portability. Oh, there's Chip. Hi, Chip. Um, a lot of people are concerned about uh, cloud portability. Uh, so I want to open up the floor to talk a little bit about the importance of portability, what it means to you, and what kind of tools users need to have to really be portable acro across plow uh, clouds. Sorry. Uh, Greg, you want to get started? Sure. Uh so eucalyptus has a particular place in the world, and so uh, I speak from that perspective. Uh, and, and that perspective uh, is that uh, AWS is the dominant public cloud by an order of magnitude, uh, and we feel like it is a worthy endeavor uh, just to focus on making interoperability with AWS clouds uh, as easy as possible uh, for those who want their own uh, open source uh, private cloud. Uh, so, uh, we feel like uh, interoperability is, of course, hugely important, and it's going to be getting more important all the time, uh, and our very particular take on that uh, is to uh, have those people who are sort of hooked on AWS making sure that they've got a good open source option. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, Chip, you want to respond to that, or do you have anything to add, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, portability is, is one of the more complicated topics um, in the space, right? Because you, you're really not just talking about API fidelity, um, although that is a very, very critical topic. Um, you, you're also talking about virtual machine images. Um, you're dealing with some of the challenges around uh, data gravity, right? So as, as a particular um, company or organization continues to consume services from a, from a specific provider, they're putting more and more data in that provider, and one of the bigger challenges is actually how do you deal with all of those bits being moved. Um, so, so to me, it's a little bit more of a, a broader topic than simply you know APIs, um, and and I would say that right now the industry is still trying to figure out the API uh, answer. Some answers are you know AWS and and CloudStack does support that as well. Um, I think that's obviously the um, leader in the market right now. Um, most organizations are, are uh, looking at Amazon as the initial way to join, you know, or start using the cloud. Um, but we're still really early on, and as you consume more and more services, it actually gets harder and harder to, to migrate to like environments. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves. Okay. Um, Alan, what do you have to say on the topic? Well, so I, I agree with the, the, the gentleman that has spoken about the API interfaces. Um, so we do have somewhat of a de facto standard there from, from AWS to build upon. So let me add one more point. I, I think it's also important that uh, you have a standard operating environment um, that's available both in, in the public space, across the public clouds, and the private space. So particularly as you start talking about enterprises and they're building uh, use of, of clouds in their private er in their private er enterprises, as well as um, uh, enveloping uh, the use of public clouds. It's very important that they can have a standard operating environment, which includes a standard operating system in both environments. Okay. Um, anything anything to add or to talk about with that, Greg or Chip? Any concerns uh, when you're thinking about? Um, you know, a standard operating system or, you know, I know a lot of people are much less concerned maybe with the operating system level now than being able to replicate uh, the same uh, tool set with Puppet or something like that rather than the operating system itself. Any thoughts on that? 
Uh, tons. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, every organization is going to have to, as a matter of course, figure out how to standardize their environments in a way that maybe they've never had to before or haven't had to in the same way. Um, having uh, an image or images that are identical across environments is obviously critical. Uh, understanding the provenance of how those environments were created. Uh, having tools that can guarantee that those environments are as similar to one another as is possible, you know, ideally identical. Um, these are all, uh, they're prerequisites for doing anything the cloud way. Uh, and fortunately, I think that, you know, in the open source world, there's so many good choices uh, that it really is a, a matter of taste. You know, uh, if you look at you know, the dominance of Ubuntu in, uh, in Amazon, for instance, the number, if you ever go through and look at how many, uh, you know, images are out there, there's just a ton of Ubuntu images uh, because people are comfortable with it. Um, you know, and I, I think that uh, the easy availability uh, of Linux and the ease to, to standardize on it is, is making it a, a great choice for that. Okay. Uh, anything to add to that, Chip? Yeah, well, I, I completely agree that you know Linux tends to be the the predominant workload for the cloud. Um, obviously, you know Windows uh, continues to be a big player um, in a lot of companies, and so there's gonna there's gonna still be a need for for those companies to transition applications to a to a different um, different environment, and hopefully, you know, take advantage of at least some of the uh, um, cost savings you can get through scale. The the other interesting thing to consider is is the paths. Landscape, right? So, so we've we've really been talking about virtual machines, and in the context of infrastructure as a service, um, what I find to be really intriguing right now is how the kind of line of business developers in, in large companies are um, they, they're beginning their shift away from just simply getting VMs as quick as they can to focusing on the applications themselves. Now, I mean, I, I'm not here to represent a PaaS project or anything, but um, I I believe that the application is always the the reason why you use infrastructure. Um, and we're going to see some of the exact same discussions occur at that, that application container level that right now we're, we're really focused on at the, the VM container level. Um, and it's also possible that, that it might uh, simplify you know, some of the infra infrastructure as a service debates as um, more applications are designed to run in a PaaS, and, and, and that PaaS itself could just simply select one OS. Okay. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about one of the things that... Um, I, you know, we talked about last year, I think, at LinuxCon and Cloud Open, uh, was the open cloud. And, and everybody has a, or many people have slightly different uh, opinions of what open really is. Um, for example, uh, Red Hat, I think it was um, maybe Richard, who's supposed to be joining, had coined a, you know, a seven-layer uh, thing for openness, whereas other players say, well, we have an open API, and that makes us open. It doesn't matter if the source is open. Um, so if you're, you know, when you're talking about open, what makes a cloud open? And um, if all of the tools are open source, does that guarantee that it's open? Um, what, you know, what makes open cloud for you? You want to start, Greg? Uh, sure. What makes open cloud for me is a cloud that I have in my own hot little hands that's open. Uh, okay. And that's almost the extent of it. <laughs> uh, it you know, there's this sort of whole overarching open cloud idea um, and, and, you know, I think the, the conversation sort of gets hung up, uh, you know, because public clouds by their nature are sort of not open. They're service providers. It's a different thing. What you want is the opportunity to be able to build an environment for yourself that you have control of, and you want to be able to make sure that you can get workloads into it easily from whatever public cloud provider you've chosen. And if you want to, you know, burst out to the public cloud when you, you know, your your private cloud is full, uh, you want to have that option as well. And for me, that's you know, pretty much as far as it goes, right? Um, and obviously, the enablers for that uh, are questions around API, questions about images, and having open images that can be widely shared. That's important. Um, I think increasingly having uh, open standards around uh, uh, software-defined uh, networking is going to be gigantic, right? Uh, you know, from the people I see who are putting together clouds 
uh, almost without exception, the hardest part to get right is the networking piece. It's the it's the piece that people are uh, least likely to uh, understand and get right immediately. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, open protocols, open standards around uh, networking are going to be hugely helpful. All right. So by what you were saying there, if, if um, VMware, for example, vCloud had a convenient way to move workloads back and forth to other providers. Are you saying that would be open if you have control over it even though you don't have the source? Well, all, so all of the open source caveats apply, right? When I say I have a cloud, you know, I have been an open source so long that when I say that, I mean that I have the source code to the cloud in question, right? Okay. So I have my own uh, cloud. I have control over the bits and the source code and can hack it up and innovate with it and make changes as necessary. But that's all private cloud, right? And with the public cloud, the uncomfortable truth is that you are never going to know precisely what's running there uh, because they're they're not your you know it's not your machine. You can't touch the bits, right? So you know, and I'm happy for good faith uh, efforts that people are you know sharing that source code. But you know, the the open cloud I care most about is the one I can put my hands on. Okay, uh, who wants to go next, Chip or Alan? Um, I could just add to. I, I'll go ahead. I can just add to that. So I so I agree with what Greg is saying. Um, but if you think about it, open source, uh, we're all running under the Apache. Well, at least CloudStack and OpenStack are running the Apache license, which means somebody can take that open source and implement it in a way that you know is proprietary because um, they can just copy the stuff and do whatever. So. Which goes back to Greg's comment of, of feeling comfortable with having those those bits and being able to set up um, your stack the way you want it, um, which is great for the private clouds. But you're right in the public clouds. But the actual case really should be that, as a from a, a consumer or customer's perspective, um, the applications should be built in such a way that it's somewhat agnostic to whether it's open source or not. Okay, Chip, do you have anything to add to that, or I, I think that uh, both both points are very good. Um, there's a provider perspective, and whether you're talking about um, an internal IT department or you know, even just a dev team that's set up in a very small environment, um, all the way up to you know large scale clouds, um, they, there are operator challenges. Many of those challenges are resolved through the use of open source. Um, and and open standards. When we think about southbound APIs, um, you know, SDN was was uh, was mentioned. Clearly, there's a lot of activity in that space, but uh, very little industry consensus. I would say um, maybe some is forming around OpenFlow as a as a subcomponent. Um, so operators have a lot of challenges. Number one, and the the other perspective that's also very important is that user perspective. So you know, the actual uh, end user who's deploying the VMs, who's Who's trying to um, probably do a couple of things, right? First, they're they're trying to quickly get access to the infrastructure that they need, um, regardless of the container style that they're working with. Um, and then two, and we we still really have not solved this as an industry, um, enable you know easy and, and, and true portability uh, between maybe regions of a particular large provider, uh, local environments, um, a, as well as just alternate alternate public providers. So. To the end user, the the bits that make up the service should mean very little, uh, but to the providers themselves, it should mean a ton. Um, and everybody kind of meets at the at the middle with the APIs that are made available. Okay. Um, let's so move on. Add, oh, sorry. I so I agree with his comments, and and my comment was coming from you know the the user's perspective, but on the provider's perspective, I think open source makes a huge and the uh, the evidence of that is the momentum that we have with open source itself, right? People are finding, uh, so we could list all the advantages of open source, and those apply in the cloud space. And that's why cloud, particularly the open source cloud, is going to win. Okay. Um, plus one to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is anybody against open cloud on the, on the uh, panel, if you want to make an argument against that now? Um, you know, anybody? No. Okay, good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, 
shift gears again and let's talk a little bit about uh, hypervisors. Um, each platform has support for different hypervisors um, and have different approaches to how they support them. Um, does it matter which hypervisors you support and you know if so going into the future for the open cloud which hypervisor or hypervisors do you think are going to really matter uh, you know five years from now? Who wants to start with that? I'm happy to take that one um, okay. to start. I'm sure everybody has an opinion on it. You know, I'll, I'll take a long view first. Um, my long view is that hypervisors, I, I mean, effectively that technology is rapidly being commoditized. Um, the, the reality is that if you look at the way VMware um, is shifting some of their, their commercial uh, focus, they realize that too, right? So um, it, we, we should reach a point uh, very, I would say very similar to just simply Linux, uh, where knowing that you can get a free, well-maintained, well-supported operating system or hypervisor um, is going to be uh, easy for everyone to do. There's going to be very little value that's added in a particular hypervisor. Now, that, that's a long-range view, right? The, the path to get there is going to take us you know, down some uncharted roads. And in order to help bring enterprises, providers, and end users along this, this journey that the industry is taking, um, supporting multiple hypervisors within the same cloud environment is actually important, right? Yep. We're at a minimum providing an operator with the choices that are necessary um, or the choices that they might, they, they might make, right? They have operational considerations, they have cost considerations. Um, there, there is still some feature difference, uh, difference between the, the hypervisors right now, um, whether you're talking about specific OSs that are supported or more advanced features. Um, now, you know, that, that's all being abstracted to a certain extent, but um, as, the, as we mature, um, I do think that we're going to get to a point where, where the hypervisor um, battle should really just be kind of limited to maybe one or two uh, freely available options. All right. Um, Alan, you have uh, thoughts on that? I mean, uh, you know, working with SUSE, you guys have historically been a big supporter of Zen. Uh, also, KVM, uh, you know, they have the whole theory of the perfect guest. Where, where do you stand on that? Yeah, I was going to say, so SUSE continues to contribute heavily to, to Zen. Uh, and by the way, we applaud the effort uh, where Zen has now set up the uh, new advisory council within the Linux Foundation. I think that's great. Um, and the reality is, as uh, Chip pointed out, the reality is in the short term, um, particularly in enterprise environments, they've got multiple hypervisors. And I guess I, I would say our challenge is, is that um, uh, we, you know, well, and they've picked those hypervisors because of the different workloads that they're, they're trying to entertain and based on the uh, characteristics of the hypervisors, they've, they've picked those for best performance or whatever, you know, the requirements are. Our challenge is, is really uh, we should be hypervisor agnostic, right? Cloud should be able to perform on whatever hypervisor those, those uh, consumers pick. And in the public environment, uh, and from a customer perspective, it should be, you know, agnostic. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll challenge that a little bit. Um, okay. You know, work, working with one of the projects, there is, you know, always an overhead with supporting um, you know, each hypervisor and you, you run into, you know, maybe one hypervisor isn't as well loved as the other ones in terms of support. Um, do you think cloud providers should maybe be, or it's not okay for them to be opinionated and say, you know, we're, we're going to pick these two or something like that? So the public cloud providers, yeah, they're going to pick one, right? And they're going to focus their business on one based on the customer set that they have. and, and by choosing one, um, they'll definitely pick a customer set. But um, I, I'm just saying from from our open source project perspective, I think we need to be looking and try to make our um, applications and, and um, services as agnostic to hypervisors as we can. Okay. Uh, Greg, do you have anything to add on this, or what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I, I think the world of the open source hypervisor is already uh, largely agnostic and a matter of taste. 
Uh, and I think that, you know, KVM and Zen are the winners there, and I think that they will continue to be uh, fighting it out for one, two, for the foreseeable future in the open source world. Uh, and uh, those are going to be the basis of every open source cloud that's built. Uh, you know, VMware is in an interesting position where they want to continue to prove that there is value in the hypervisor uh, so that they can lock in people who've already chosen that hypervisor, right? One of the interesting things about cloud and one of the things that, that you know, we leverage Eucalyptus for uh, is that in our ability to support both the open hypervisors uh, and uh, VMware, uh, we give uh, cloud users an option to abstract that away while they figure out what their future path is. Uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 the world of cloud makes uh, uh, workload management different. And I don't think organizations understand those differences yet. Uh, but as they start getting, uh, standing up their own clouds at scale, figuring out how self-service provisioning works in this new world, uh, figuring out, you know, workload capacity questions uh, in this new world, uh, I think they're going to naturally lean towards the kind of hypervisor that's all you can eat, right? Uh, and I think that's going to be to the ongoing detriment of folks like VMware. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, uh, one thing, one th important thing for us is that uh, KVM and Zen are both uh, first-class citizens in the kernel at this point. Uh, and, you know, we're based off of a, a RHEL platform right now. It's what we standardized on. Uh, and so when Zen uh, receives that same sort of first-class support, uh, you know, we will sort of inherit that. And I think that's going to be the case for a lot of folks. Okay. Um, I think anything else to add on that, Chip or Alan? Anything you want to add? Or I'm not seeing yep. any. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So this is an IRC, Chip. You can actually nod your head, and I and I'll know. That's true. <laughs> um, okay. So let's let's try another question here. Um, I think there's a little less heat uh, behind this one as there was last year. Uh, we've already talked about open and APIs, but I don't think we've specifically addressed, you know, how crucial are is AWS API compatibility. Um, I think that's, you know, that was a big topic last year. You know, people were arguing that everybody had, you know, let's just declare AWS API, you know, the HTTP of cloud and go from there. And of course, there were folks in certain camps that were really offended by that, and they didn't like Amazon having the control over that. So how how important is AWS API compatibility uh, in reality for your project? And then, you know, talk a little bit about that, how you see that going in the future. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pick on Greg first since his project is obviously uh, opinionated on this topic. Right. Uh, you know, opinionated. I think there's room for a lot of APIs, right? But I think it's absolutely crucial that the AWS API be well served with a free alternative and that is why I'm at Eucalyptus. Uh, as AWS continues to move forward quickly with the number of services they offer, uh, their APIs are going to continue to accelerate, and, as is the usage of those APIs, right? Now, there's going to be, I think there is a strong independent movement to uh, use services in a way that are API agnostic, right? A lot of the services that AWS provides, uh, you you can do in other ways. And I think that for uh, users who want to be truly cloud agnostic, they will invest the time and energy to figure out how to do things like auto scaling uh, in a way that is independent of an API. However, there are a large number of users in AWS who are already making those choices. Uh, and, you know, at Eucalyptus, it's, you know, it's, it's been our strategic goal from the very beginning to provide that alternative to AWS users. And in a way, it makes our job easier because we don't have to try to innovate around the API itself. Uh, we simply see the services that people most need next and go implement them, right? So that's why in Eucalyptus 3.3, which is coming up here soon, uh, we've got auto-scaling groups and CloudWatch, and we've got improved tagging, and we've got elastic load balancing, and all those sort of next generation features that AWS users are growing accustomed to. And we want to make the switching costs to private cloud 
uh, back and forth, in fact, uh, as minimal uh, as we possibly can. So for that set of users, I think it's extremely important. I would say crucial, uh, but that's not going to be all of the users of the cloud. And certainly competitors to AWS uh, can and should have different views. Okay. Um, Alan, you want to go next? Sure. So, you know, AWS, EC2, we're, we're talking de facto standards here, right? And so having, having that support uh, does make it a lot easier for uh, system administrators to, to uh, do their work in, in different environments. But we're already seeing um, brokerage solutions come out that are, you know, uh, with the name to uh, make workloads, uh, be able to move workloads between uh, different interfaces. So being, you know, the solutions are happening around us. I, I think the second part of it is is we need to, how cloud is going to look in five years, I think is going to be very different than it is today. And so I'm very much more focused on the future and making sure we can get there. And a good example of that is, as uh, Greg brought up earlier, we've got SDN coming, right? We've got to make sure the interfaces work with these new services that are coming online. Okay. Um, Chip, do you have anything to add or? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Amazon API um, support today is absolutely required of, of all of our projects, right? Um, de facto standard, no question there. Again, kind of looking at a looking at the long range, there are some problems with it being a de facto standard right now. The problem is that um, Amazon is is effectively owning that API on their own, right? Um, now they they do a good job of trying to keep it consistent as best as they can. Obviously, they've built an ecosystem around it, um, and you know for the same reason why we should all be supporting it, um, they they're going to work on maintaining some level of stability there. Uh, th I think the real the real problem comes in as new services are developed, right? So, so not necessarily how do you spin up a virtual machine, but um, more more contextually aware services. Amazon being the only, uh, if they're the de facto standard, and then their engineering team is the only team working on that API, um, you, you, they really are ending up leading the industry um, quite a bit now. How long will they be able to do that? At what point will will they see a uh, you know, reasonably scaled competitor that, that catches up with them, um, that uses a different API, and then you know, maybe in 10 years we're talking about a completely different de facto API. I'm not make, necessarily making a prediction about Amazon's success or failure. Um, you know, Jeff obviously, obviously knows how to grow a business. Um, but, but there are some challenges around you know, them, uh, kind of the, the closed model there. Um, now, the, the other way, the, way, the other way that I look at these APIs is that really they're just a manifestation of the basic, um, they should be a manifestation of the basic abstractions that, that are being orchestrated underneath. Um, and, and so you don't necessarily need a lot of innovation in the API itself as much as new services that you're going to offer uh, that Amazon might not be offering, right? So that, that, that's where there'll be a difference. Um, and then how those services are actually exposed you know, that's not really going to be a novel thing. And frankly, you know, APIs, um, if, if we're all kind of watching the press, APIs aren't patentable. Um, you know, realistically, anybody can use APIs. Um, the, the question is, where do they get defined and how do they evolve, right? Yeah, crossing fingers, absolutely. <laughs> um, so kind of a mixed message there, right? It, it's a no-brainer right now. Um, it's also the right long-term bet, um, it, at least in, in, the, in the foreseeable future. But we should all make sure that we're um, able to decouple our services from a specific API implementation and orchestrate based on you know a second or a third or a fourth API. Uh, give our users options, give the operators options, um, and and we'll see where we go. Okay, um, so you know in the long term, if if the open cloud industry doesn't want to see Amazon in control. Um, is it just going to be a, you know, 20 different APIs or however many, you know, open clouds there are? Or, you know, is there any way that we can ever have a standard, an open standard between the different cloud players that isn't run by Amazon? 
Well, I mean, there are open standards, right? Um, but, but then you can kind of argue the level of openness depending on what organization they came from. Um, I, I guess my point was less about the uh, standard being open and more focused on the, you know, our projects and, and how we implement APIs. So, um, and also, how do we support the, the consumers of, of the services? So, making sure, that, for example, that, that um, CloudStack support within JClouds or FOG um, is operable, is, is critical, right? Because that, that really gives a local library um, that, that abstracts a lot of the different challenges. Um, so I, I would say that, that really being able to support multiple options is, is the best bet for any project right now. Um, there are certainly bodies uh, as well as projects that would love to have their API be kind of canonical uh, as the standard, right? Um, and, and there's, there's going to continue to be a lot of, um, I would say, industry argument in this space for, for at least the next decade. Yeah. Okay. Alan, uh, I think you have some experience with standards. Any thoughts? So I pretty much uh, agree with his, his statements there. I mean, we've seen a lot of good progress in, in some of the standards bodies. In, in, uh, but like he said, I think, like I said, cloud's going to look different in five years. Um, so we're still going to have battles on what those interfaces should look like as we go forward. Okay. Uh, Greg, anything to add on that? or? Yeah. Uh, I think a good point that Chip made obliquely uh, and part of the eucalyptus focus, it's easy to get lost in an API. APIs are massive. Some corners of those APIs are exercised uh, rigorously, and some of them languish uh, with only a handful of users. Uh, and what tends to represent that is the tool chains that are built up around those APIs. So when he talks about FOG and JClouds, uh, those are, those are uh, the standards to which we hold ourselves uh, when we compare our compatibility to AWS uh, at, at the API level. Um, you know, and, and the nice thing about that is that, you know, for us it's a very close line to getting fog working for eucalyptus because there are only a very small handful of differences where we're different from the AWS API and we can work to minimize those differences uh, and so that gives us a faster time to market to get those tools working. But at the same time the existence of those tools as standardized tools on top of the API also allow for common places where uh, uh, service level abstraction and interoperability can legitimately happen, right? I think that's one of the, the huge values of, uh, you know, FOG, for instance, is, is sort of already ubiquitous. I mean, it's behind uh, both uh, Puppet and Chef's Cloud Provisioner uh, pieces. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, I think that tool approach is going to be key going forward, and uh, the more that we can get together and sort of pick the tools that we think are best, uh, the more opportunity we have potentially to abstract away the APIs underneath those tools. Okay. Um, I'm going to cut in with sort of a commercial break for a second and remind folks who have joined a little bit late. Um, this is a kind of a preview of the uh, open cloud panel we're going to be doing in New York at the End User Summit uh, in a couple of weeks. If you have questions you'd like to see us address right now, we're working off a list of questions that we prepared before the panel, but if you have a question for somebody in the panel or for the whole panel, feel free to add it in the comments and we will try to get to that before our time is up. We still have about 20 minutes left, uh, so we're going to move on to another question, but again, if you have anything that you would like to ask, please go ahead and add it in the comments. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, you know the reality. I was at uh, DevOps Days last week and talking to a few folks, uh, talking to Donnie from uh, Redmond. And he mentioned, you know, there's a lot of, he sees a lot of folks doing DevOps, he sees a lot of folks doing cloud, but uh, he does not see those two together a whole lot. Um, so there are a lot of people doing cloud as sort of a uh, virtualization 2.0, um, and, you know, there are a lot of folks that have legacy workloads that are just not cloudy. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how to deal with that, how your solution deals with that, um, and where we're going to be in a couple of years. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start off if, if, it's, if it's okay with Alan on this one since, you know, obviously SUSE has a long history with customers running what we would define as legacy workloads and customers who are looking ahead to 
you know, what, what they want to run in five years. So a, a, lot, of, a lot of the work that, uh, from putting my SUSE hat on, a lot of the work that we're doing around that area has to do with the tool sets, getting them ready to move into those, into the cloud environments. Um, so, um, right, you, they're, they're, they're using an, what I would call an enterprise level OS, one that's been certified, tested, uh, and then secondly, the, the, uh, you, they need the management tools, they need the patch tools um, so that they can uh, take care of, of their new environment. You've got to have image creation tools, uh, which we talked a little bit about earlier. Um, tools that uh, give them that ability to migrate. And uh, we found that's pretty key uh, in, well, and those tools have to fit in with their, their business policies and business processes. We found that's been a big key. Um, let's go ahead and uh, Chip, what do you have to say on this? I know that you have some experience in this in this area. Yeah, so, so from the, the CloudSec project's perspective, we fundamentally believe in two workload story, right? Um, there are going to be like what we call legacy applications um, for 50 years. And I know that, you know, in, in some circles of the, uh, of the cloud industry, there are plenty of folks who would say that that's heresy, right? Um, but there are absolutely <laughs> benefits for private clouds uh, to be able to support a, a more traditional um, environment that, that needs to ensure virtual machine stability and availability. Now, on the other side of things, there's the, there's the new architectures, right? There's the design for failure, scale out, um, the types of apps that you would actually enjoy unleashing uh, the Netflix Simeon army on, right? Um, and those two workload styles are, are going to be with us for a long time. In the private cloud space, we need to, as projects, support them. Um, in the provider space, I, I also believe that the providers are going to continue to offer um, two variants of, of, you know, quote, cloud services, right? One of them being um, really much closer to AWS style, uh, and the other being that, that legacy style. And we're going to use different technologies for those, for those different types of workloads underneath the, uh, the cloud orchestration software. Uh, we're going to have different SLAs. We're going to need to be able to do things like tiering, uh, tiering storage appropriately, um, automatically adding uh, availability attributes to an environment, um, using potentially traditional uh, network isolation technologies, if, if there are reasons for that. Um, so, uh, you know, that was a little long-winded, but the uh, short version is, you know, we, we believe that both workloads are, uh, are worthy of getting some of the benefits of full automation, um, and we're, we're working to ensure that CloudStack supports both. Okay. Um, and uh, Greg, do you have anything? I'm sure that uh, Eucalyptus has kind of a, maybe a different take on this, given your relationship with the Amazon style work. Not, not as different as you might think, right? Part of the, in a way, we're a bridge to AWS because there are plenty of people who would love to enter the new world uh, of, you know, the, the DevOps way. Uh, but they are shackled to legacy applications, and those legacy applications aren't going away anytime soon. Uh, and it's uh, much more likely uh, for that class of user to be able to get a legacy application running in some local cloud that feels a lot like virtualization management, uh, as opposed to pushing stuff into the actual cloud uh, where the rules really are different. Right. One of one of the potential advantages of private cloud is that to some degree you get the best of both worlds. Um, so we do think that uh, legacy workloads are going to continue to be important. They tend to have different performance characteristics. Uh, you know, we tend to need to be able to customize the configuration of uh, a cloud we put on a customer site uh, to uh, help deal with the different performance characteristics of legacy applications. Uh, you know, legacy application users love our EBS implementation because it means they don't have to figure out how to do uh, instant store and, you know, uh, uh, sort of cloudy volume management. They can just uh, shove it all in and, you know, use a gigantic EBS volume and run that uh, that uh, 
legacy workload uh, just as plain old virtualized. Um, you know, and, and there are challenges to doing that, right? When you don't design uh, an application for failure, uh, which is the cloudy way, it means that you have to guarantee uptime and you have to, uh, you know, fight to make sure that uh, you have, basically you have all of the same uh, problems you have just dealing with any virtualization solution. Um, but at least you get your opportunity to, to dip your toe in. Uh, you get an opportunity to learn how cloud is supposed to work. Uh, and if you have applications that may need to talk to those legacy applications but not be legacy applications themselves, you have the opportunity to sort of develop those and, and sort of chart a path towards your future, which is what we see a lot of our customers doing. Okay. Um, next question I want to, we've touched on this a little bit, but I want to get a little bit deeper into it. Um, the importance of SDN, everybody has kind of touched on that, I think, at one point or another talked about the importance of SDN uh, and also its immaturity. So I want to ask, you know, where do you see that going in the next few years? What uh, solution or projects are going to be dominant in that area? Um, what problems are yet to be solved? Just kind of interested in your take on SDN and where you're at with your project and where it's going. Um, we've. Uh, kind of wrapped around the panel. I'll start with Alan again if, if you have anything on the topic, Alan. Well, so in regards to SDN, uh, OpenStack has the quantum module, right? Um, and there's a ton of momentum with that. Quantum is now an integrated project within OpenStack uh, with the uh, Grizzly release that went out in April. Um, second part, um, you'll notice uh, the uh, uh, Open Daylight project has now been launched uh, as a work group as part of the Linux Foundation. Um, a lot of huge momentum there. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very excited and, and uh, hopeful for the future with that group to, on their success. Um, so you'll see a lot of synergy, I think, between their efforts and our, our uh, cloud efforts, uh, particularly with uh, Plugins and and connections into uh, into the cloud stacks. Okay, um, Chip, what do you uh, what are your thoughts on SDN and where it's going? Yeah, so r right now, um, the the solutions that are on the market that that are kind of tying themselves to the the SDN acronym um, are largely focused on network isolation technologies, right? So uh, whether, whether you're, and, and controlling that network isolation. Um, now, you know, OpenFlow being the, being simply a, a wire protocol that, um, that a lot of vendors and hardware, hardware vendors as well as software companies are, are working to use to, to take that control plane, um, you know, out of the actual forwarding plane. It, you know, it has a lot of potential. Um, I think that I also think that the industry is very early on with figuring out what software-defined networking really needs to go accomplish. Um, scale is a problem that needs to be dealt with, um, but also there, there's the question of network services and network service composition, which is really a much more interesting area than simply L2 isolation. Um, I think Open Daylight is a, it certainly has a lot of vendors involved. Um, I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, I'm not very intimately involved with it, so I'm, I'm not going to, you know, pass judgment at, at this point as to uh, its direction. Um, as much as it, it's good to see industry cooperation there, um, and it's also important to me that it that it is looking at the problem much more holistically than just simply, um, you know, the switching fabric uh, questions that that you know, kind of the open flow um, world is focused on. Um, CloudStack itself. I mean, just I'll hit that briefly, right? So CloudStack itself. Uh, supports multiple isolation types, like I referred to. Um, you know, we work with Nasira. We've got integrations coming in from Big Switch and Mitakura. Uh, we do traditional VLAN isolation. Um, you know, as well as uh, the the more kind of AWS style, um, you know, security groups um, with, with effectively you know L3 uh, isolation between the instances. Um, but we also think about services like load balancing and firewalling, uh, VPN terminations, etc. Um, we think of those services as being just as important as um, as how you actually get you know switching into the into the instances, 
And so um, we've got similar plugins there where we you know, have abstracted the firewalling constructs and the load balancing constructs um, and then allow our providers choice in, in the physical gear um, or the virtual gear that they use to, to manage those network services. Um, I, I do see that there's, there's going to be a long, uh, a very rapid progression away from physical hardware doing a lot of the network services, right? Um, the, the cable industry is an example. Um, a good friend of mine's chief architect at uh, one of the major networking companies for, for cable and MSO. Um, and, and we spent some time discussing how network services uh, running within a infrastructure as a service cloud, kind of the convergence of our, our two jobs, um, is a really hot topic in, in those providers. Um, and I think that's going to continue to accelerate as more and more virtual appliances get deployed as those virtual appliances become more aware of the context within which they're running, um, the, the virtual data center, for lack of a better term, that they're, they're supporting, um, as well as the interconnectivity between the various app environments that the, the users have. OK. Um, so you know we've had a pretty good conversation so far. We're down to about nine minutes. Um, answered a lot of uh, general questions about cloud and everything, but we haven't had a really good argument yet. So maybe we can. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we can spark one a little bit with, uh, let's talk a little bit about licensing. Um, you know, um, I'd like for folks to spend a couple minutes on the licensing choice they've made for their project and the community style and how that fits and does it even matter in the larger picture? Is it just, you know, for that project or is it going to have, um, is it going to matter in the long term picture? Um, now I know a couple of folks on the panel are, are you know, kind of unified on the Apache license, um, but uh, hopefully there's enough divergence for at least a little conversation here. Who would like to go first on that one? <laughs> I'll hit it. it look, looks like everybody else is dodging it, right? So, um, open source licensing is uh, is obviously is very complicated when you think about all the different license flavors that are out there. Um, if you boil it down to um, what, what I would think is the main difference between the copylefts, um, uh, you know, strong copyleft, weak copyleft, and, and then the more commercially friendly um, licenses, um, we're, we're working in a space where companies are involved, right? These are vendors, these are service providers, these are um, enterprises. The, the license that we use for our projects should be friendly to those organizations so that they have the, the right uh, and the ability to take the code, run with it, and do whatever they want. Um, forking is good, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, now, it also presents some challenges. Um, and so, you know, as the, the communities grow, um, you, you do need to do a very good job of community management to bring people back together. So while you have a very friendly license for, for, um, to, to make the lawyers happy, um, you, you need to double down on your efforts on uh, community management. Okay. Um, who would like to go next there? I'll go next. Okay. So, 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 so I agree with Chip. I mean, it, a lot of it, and, and OpenStack has picked the Apache license. Um, and a big part of it is ensuring that uh, we're compatible with the tool sets and, and uh, um, applications and so forth that are being used in conjunction with OpenStack. So it's... Just adding what he, you know, was mentioned earlier, it's it's not just about uh, the project itself, but making sure we're compatible with all the tool sets that go around with it, and that's a big, uh, uh, a big consideration. Um, and as you also mentioned, a uh, part of that it has to do with the uh, principles of the project itself and, and the degrees of openness, and um, those those policies within the different projects that we're talking about here are very similar. Some of them very slightly, um, but uh, the biggest part is to ensure that we keep the openness and transparency around the projects so that um, the, the community can contribute and participate and feel confident that uh, their contributions will remain open. Okay. Um, Greg, anything to add or thoughts on what's been said so far? Uh, uh, people who adhere to the Apache license uh, hate freedom. <laughs> no, I, no. <laughs> no. 
I know you have better trolling <laughs> skills than that, Greg. I know you. Um, trolling hard? No. Uh, it's you know it's largely a question of business model, right? Uh, and I think one of the most uh, the the interesting thing to look at in this space. Uh, is the history of cloud.com and then it's purchased by Citrix uh, and the change the cloud stack made. Uh, when you are a smaller company as cloud.com was and you're betting on open source software, it's uh, much more difficult to justify being Apache licensed uh, at the very beginning, right? So uh, I think that's why cloud.com was originally GPL. And then when they were purchased by Citrix and the decision was made to uh, move into uh, the Apache world, I think that connected directly to a, a different strategy uh, with a, a larger industry player and needing to play with other larger industry players, right? Which is uh, a perfect rationale for Citrix making that jump from GPL to uh, Apache with CloudStack. Uh, at Eucalyptus, we are, uh, you know, we have a, a very clear place in the market, uh, and the GPL uh, continues to be uh, more of a net good for us than a net bad. But there are challenges, right? We have, uh, you know, we have a number of customers who find it more difficult to contribute code to the core, uh, and they, we have to be more committed to them, uh, and they have to be more committed to us for them to go through the additional uh, headaches of contributing to a GPL project. Uh, and many of the tools that sit on top of Eucalyptus are uh, Apache licensed for that very reason. Uh, you know, but it's, it's courses for horses, uh, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, right now the GPL, I think, is best for us. Okay. Um, so we are almost out of time, but I want to give everybody a chance to you know, include a couple final thoughts and uh, go from there. So, Greg, do you have anything you want to close with? Uh, rah, rah, Eucalyptus 3.3 is going to be awesome. It's got lots of uh, more AWS compatible features. Dig in. Uh, go to eucalyptus.com slash fast start uh, and take it for a spin. And when is, is that out now or is that soon? No, it's, uh, it's going to be sometime uh, in late May or early June is our best guess at this point. But, you know, software. So. Right. Yeah, We're, we are, uh, in fact, familiar with that, yeah. Uh, speaking of which, uh, we'll go to Chip. Any last thoughts or uh, comments? Yeah, well, since we're taking an opportunity to push the projects, I'll, uh, I'll say um, a reminder for the world, the uh, CloudSec Collaboration Conference uh, for North America is uh, coming up in, uh, in late June. And um, also look for announcements about a European conference as well. Um, and come join us at cloudstack.apache.org. Okay, thank you, Chip. And Alan, last word. Last word. I got the last word. That's pretty good. So OpenStack just had its summit. Uh, we just uh, completed that two weeks ago up in Portland. Uh, had over 2,600 people attend uh, and participate in the conference. Huge success, huge momentum. We just released Grizzly, um, our seventh release. And uh, go check it out. It's awesome stuff. And thanks for uh, inviting us all today. To right. this event. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Uh, we'll close. I want to thank everybody for joining, Greg, Chip, and Alan. Uh, thanks, everybody, who you know signed up. This was the first, I think, Linux Foundation Google Hangout, so we probably had a few glitches. But uh, if you have comments or thoughts, leave them in the chat or the comments. Uh, this should be up as a recording um, probably in the next day or so. I think they're going to go ahead and look and see if they need to edit anything or trim the beginning or end. <laughs> Um, we'll be rehashing this with some other folks on the uh, End User Summit in New York in a couple weeks, and uh, we hope that uh, if you're there, you will join us. Thanks a lot for listening, and have a good day. Thanks, everyone.